Confidence is the key to unlocking our best performances. Or is it? In today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Peter Habrell. Peter has been a senior sports psychologist for the US Olympic Committee for the last 25 years. This guy knows his stuff. In today's episode, we discuss whether chasing the feelings of confidence before a performance is actually a good idea at all. So as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Peter Haberl to the Performance Psychology Podcast. Uh, Peter has been a senior sports psychologist for the US Olympic Committee for over two decades now, and I'm just beyond excited to have him on the podcast. So welcome, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Trevor. Pleasure to be here. So, Peter, you've got a really interesting background in that you had a bit of a switch within your career within sports psychology and moved to a different approach with athletes. Can you talk a little bit about the the history and the reasons why and and how that came about? Uh, Yes, well, I was kind of trained in what I would now label traditional or old sports psychology. You know, this idea of, of, of training mental skills, goal setting, imagery, relaxation, self-talk, and all that good stuff. Uh, and then I had some, some, some training actually with, with Albert Ellis in rational motor behavior therapy. And I found that quite helpful in working with athletes but then once I started working um, with Olympic athletes at the Olympic Games, um, I found that that toolbox um, limiting, uh, I found that toolbox not really allowing me to prepare the athletes for what actually is happening at the Olympic Games. So what's happening to their minds at the Games. And then that led to uh, first incorporation of, of mindfulness and I try to sort of sort of merge mindfulness with a CBT approach, uh, but then again, as sort of his experience kept rolling in over successful successive Olympic Games, um, then the switch went from mindfulness plus, plus CBT to mindfulness plus ACT, basically. So acceptance and commitment training, as I like to call it. Um, so, so it was really it was really failure at the games. Um, that um, sort of awakened me then that I have to change uh, how I work with my athletes because I'm not giving them the tools that they need to be successful under under the pressure of the five rings, basically. Could you could you allude a little bit more to what that might look like in terms of the shift in the approaches between the more traditional approach and then a mindfulness plus act approach? What are the fundamental well, differences there? Well, I have this little exercise that I like to ask my athletes. So, so I, I, I put these mood cards on the table, right? Positive emotions, negative emotions. And I ask them, how do you not want to feel at the Olympic Games? And without fail, well, I had one exception, I guess, so far. But without, without, without that one exception, everybody picks unpleasant negative emotions. So they don't wanna feel anxious. They don't wanna be nervous. They don't wanna be pressured. They don't wanna be tight. They don't wanna feel alone and so forth, right? So I asked, well, why do you not want to feel that way at the games? And then you all say, well, if I feel this way, I will perform poorly at the games. Okay, that, that makes sense, right? We all agree on that. Um, and it's our job as sports psychologists to help the athletes be confident, uh, be cool, calm, and collected. That's what they want. So they, wanna, they don't want to feel the unpleasant emotions. They want to feel the pleasant emotions. All right, but the problem is, in, in my experience, um, those are the emotions that actually make an appearance at the games, right? So, so then as a next step, I'll show them some quotes from athletes and, and you know, he's one of my favorite ones. Uh, and you know, this, this will resonate with you being, being in Great Britain. Um, it's the only way to describe it, says the athlete. It feels like the gallows, very British word, right? The gallows. Uh, sometimes I have to explain to the American athletes, you're about to be hung, 
Right? Yes, yeah. That's I'm facing very... my own death. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's a, that's a very, that's a very unpleasant sensation, right? <laughs> yeah, unpleasant yeah, right. Sensation, yeah. Right. And, and 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 who would sign up for that? Like, do you want mm. to feel this way? Of course not, right? And then again, I asked the question: Well, how does how do you think this athlete did at the games? Mm. And and the the consensus is: Well, this athlete did very poorly, right? Mm. And then I have a few more of those quotes, um, sort of same storyline, right? And then I sort of reveal who, mm. who made these statements. And this one is is is, is you know Sir Chris Hoy, right? Mm. British track cyclist, winner of six gold medals at Olympic Games, describing how he felt in, in 2004 at the Athens Olympic Games, right before the, 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 the one kilometer time trial, the kilo. Yeah. And, you know, he was the reigning world champion, so he gets to go last in the event, meaning he sees everybody else's time roll in and three of the last four guys, you know, break the Olympic and world record. So you had this event, you prepared for this event for your whole life. It means the world to you. You don't know what's going to happen. Well, guess what kind of emotion will show up? An unpleasant emotion. An emotion that's going to be in the anxiety family, most likely, right? It feels like the gallows. Mm. But if in that moment, now you think you're having the wrong emotion and you have to fix that emotion, you're in big trouble. You're yeah. in big trouble. Because then you fight your own mind, right? So this is the big change that I made is, is athletes will experience these unpleasant emotional states. So my job isn't to help them get rid of those emotions, but actually to be open to them and to understand that in that moment, if you fight those emotions, those emotions actually act as a thief. And the thief will steal something that's very precious for you, right? So I asked the athlete, what, what is it you think the thief steals? And he still would say, well, it steals some, it will steal my confidence. Yeah. No, the, the, the thief steals something that's much more important. The thief will steal your ability to be in the present moment. The thief will steal attention. Okay. So, this is, the, so this is the switch around how Chris Hoy is really feeling, you'd almost say the opposite of how he'd like to feel in that moment yet he was still able to break the world record and and win gold and that was the key switch and that that's he was the, able that, to yeah that, that's the key switch right that's the key switch because because to me attention is the currency of performance not thoughts and not feelings brilliant so chris hoy he talks about in his autobiography um sitting on the bike adjusting his helmet that's a tactile sensation i can yeah. focus on that listening to the clock ticking down 10 9 8 so forth i can focus on that the moment i focus on that i'm in the present moment right mm. pressing his hands against the handlebars i can focus on that feeling his feet pressed into the pedals i can focus on that so by coming back to that sensory experience in the moment right he's present and then the gun goes off and he says he was focused basically on his race plan and then so this really the feeling of the gallows didn't didn't matter anymore yeah so this really flies in the face of you know one of the most common I, i've come up with this uh, concept that i asked my uh, my clients to check themselves for and i say um have a check of yourself for STDs. Um, and sometimes this uh, really resonates with particularly the collegiate you know, type athletes. Uh, but in this case, it stands for socially transmitted dogmas. So if I kind of scratch that a little bit more, it's, pardon the pun, <laughs> is what are, the, what are the beliefs that you're carrying around with you that have been socially or culturally transmitted uh, that you might not have even realized that you have carrying around with you. And what you're pointing to there seems to fly in the face of one of the big ones, which is in order to perform, I must feel confident. I love that metaphor that you just offered the STD. Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> that's really, because obviously when you, when you phrase it like that, right, it brings up that negative connotation. Yeah. This, is, this is something that you want to watch out for, right? You don't want to get this. 
<laughs> um, so that that's beautifully, beautifully put, beautifully put, Trevor. Um, but he, yes, like to me, that's the biggest myth that the Olympic athletes have that in order to be successful, I have to feel confident. And this is, this is just, I have to be cool, calm, and collected. And this is so woven into the fabric of, of performance and what, how athletes perceive performance. And okay, so, so we have an athlete that has, um, you know, this has been their bed, bread and butter. You know, they've been brought up on this idea of confidence, you know, out with the bad and with the good. Yeah. Uh, confidence, positive thinking. Um, at what point do they become more open to the idea of letting some of these difficult thoughts and feelings in? Like, why, why would they? Well, I think obviously it's hard to let go of, of that myth, right? This myth of, of um, I can and I should control my thoughts and my feelings. So part of my job is, is to um, put a question mark behind that myth. And um, as much as possible, I try to do that experientially. And this is where, well, to me, again, mindfulness is so helpful, right? Um, again, a very simple exercise. I get out a stopwatch and I ask the athletes, you know, once I press start, um, your job is to not have any more thoughts. Easy instruction, <laughs> right? You can control your thoughts, right? Exactly, right? So, so, so within seconds, you know, thoughts will come. Um, so I use this metaphor that, that, that the mind is a thought and emotion producing factory. So all day long, it produces thoughts and emotions. That's what it was designed for, just how it works. And, and we have a lot less control over that factory than we think. Uh, and our job isn't actually to control the factory. Our job is, is, is to, to utilize what the factory offers but not to get caught up in the factory, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously thinking is very helpful. Emotions are very helpful. Um, they provide valuable information. And we want to be informed by our thoughts and our feelings, but we don't want to be controlled by them. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in that moment at the Olympic Games, thinking my thoughts and my feelings are wrong because they are unpleasant, right? then I'm gonna fall for the trap of, I have to control these thoughts and these feelings. Yeah. And then my attention goes inward rather than focusing on the task at hand. Mm. And then the other thing I would add to that again is, is it's, it's fascinating, you know, because um, Chris Hoyas' other, other quote that, you know, that even if you're in top form, you know, you, you wanna be anywhere but here in that moment, right? So this, this urge to escape, and when I share that with athletes, particularly with endurance athletes, you see the relief on their face. And it's, it's not just me who yeah. feels this way. I'm not alone in this, right? And so Chris Hoyt can, can get away particularly quickly as well, can't he? Yeah, yes. And again, so the power of, 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 of the examples of elite athletes, right? Um, and showing them these examples and showing them that what they experience um, is very normal and won't preclude them from being successful. Yeah. I mean, for someone hearing that for the first time, uh, I'm kind of just putting myself behind the eyes of a, a listener. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's going to be a huge idea, uh, you know, a real revelation. And I guess, I guess if uh, this might, as you said, put the question mark on athletes who, you know, were maybe exhausted with the struggle, with their own experience, or kind of underperforming, uh, find themselves in their head a lot. Um, would you say that type of profile of experience, people would be more willing to explore something new? Uh, yes, yes, because you know there's this there's this 
grasping for a solution, right? Mm. Um, and they'll try everything, right? Um, I think one thing that's pretty sexy right now is technology. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then again, when they sort of come to someone like me and I offer a radically different approach, there's again this sense of relief becomes palpable, right? Mm. And that's helpful, right? That's helpful. So I think it opens the door. Um, but that's just the very beginning of the work because then it actually is going to be work. Mm. And you actually have to train this skill of awareness and openness to what will arise, right? Because that hunger to feel the right way won't mm. just go away. Won't just go away. I guess the uh, one of the wonderful things about something like mindfulness is it can literally be practiced anywhere, in any context, and those skills will be transferable to performance. Right. Uh, that is correct. Yes, mindfulness indeed can be practiced anywhere in in any context, and really, that's 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 how you want to practice it. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't so. even have to hold my hand up and say, you know, before this interview, uh, you know, I was entirely anxious and, you know, thoughts of how's this going to go and will I say the wrong thing? And um, I suppose over the years, um, I've learned to struggle less and less with that experience, kind of knowing full well that there's a, there's a mental tug of war on the other side of that. Um, that is unwinnable um, and is exhausting <laughs> and doesn't really do anything anyway. Uh, yes, a couple of comments on that. And thank you for sharing that. Because the funny thing is, is I had very similar thoughts. <laughs> right? So we're all in this together. Right? Well, exactly. We're all in this together. At least, unless you're a narcissist, then perhaps you don't have some Okay, okay. Fair, thoughts, fair comment, right? yeah. Um, but this this idea of we're all in this together, we're, we all struggle with this this thought and emotion producing factory that is our mind, right? Um, and that normalizes that experience, right? And again, this is where all these sort of athletes examples come in, is, is to normalize that experience, to validate it as well. Um, and then also, we don't have to sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? So here's another other athlete example. In all the 11 years I've been playing here, I've been doubtful. So 11 years of doubt, right? Yeah. You want to be that guy? No. No, right? That's the answer I get all the time. No, I don't want to be that guy. 11 years of doubt? Are you kidding me? That, that's, <laughs> like fun. that's a I'm lot not, of doubt. I'm not going to sign up for that, right? And then the athlete goes, and I won, never, oh, I won nine times. Mm. The athlete being Rafael Nadal talking about the French Open. Incredible. Okay. So you don't want to be Rafael Nadal. No. <laughs> one of the most fierce competitors in the history of sport. Yeah. Right? And well, maybe, yeah, I could be that guy. That's not that doesn't sound pretty good. Yeah. I, I like to be that guy, right? But then it gets better. Okay. Nadal says, I have doubt every day. Wow. Doubts, doubts, he says, are good for you in life. Wow. Now that's interesting, right? So let's, let's come back to your statement. I was anxious before this interview. My guess is that anxiety in your case was actually quite functional because it made you think about how to prepare for this interview. What questions do I want to ask, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than I'm just going to show up and, and wing it. So, 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 so the argument I'm making here with this Nadal example, doubts are good for you in life. Mm. is the unpleasant emotion may just be very functional. Mm. Nadal says doubt is good for you in life because he never underestimates an opponent. If you watch his interviews, okay, round one of Grand Slam, yeah. this guy he's playing next, it sounds like that guy is going to be the best player ever. Yeah. So he's be prepared, right? So he never underestimates an opponent and he never stops training. Like every match for him is like a FA Cup final. 
which is the big exactly problem. right right so, so the doubt that he experiences leads to certain actions that are actually beneficial for performance mm. so again doubt then isn't the problem yeah. don't have to get rid of the doubt right the anxiety you experienced prior to in the interview isn't the problem because the anxiety helped you prepare the anxiety also tells us that this was important to you to do a good job here, right? So the anxiety tells something about what you value. So these, um, so there's a, there's a lot of fallacy within these, these STDs. There's a lot of, um, would you say almost kind of Western, Westernized feel goodism? Uh, that's that's part of it. I think that's the first fallacy that that I think uh, your your concept of STDs captures. The second one that's there for, is also is is um, that we get preoccupied with an outcome orientation, mm. right? So so if I win the Olympic gold medal, I'll be happy for the rest of my life. And we just know that's that's a that's a train wreck. That's a train wreck, right? So there's this striving for goal after goal after goal, thinking once I get that goal, then I'll be happy, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's a big trap. That's very dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. So you mentioned um, working with teams, uh, and and how might mindfulness be um, kind of useful within a team environment? Well, the teams, to me, this may sound a bit weird, I think they have a collective mind, a collective mindset, right? Where, where um, even though individual athletes, they have their own sort of worries to deal with, but they have a certain feeling as a team as, as they go into a competition. And this, I think this particularly uh, predominant when a team is the favorite. Right, where, 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 where this sort of, again, confidence is present um, and a sense of, of, of certainty and, and invincibility arises. Um, that's very, very pleasant. And that's very, very addictive. Um, but to me, when that arises and you're not aware of it, it's always a trap. Because with that, sense of certainty, that sense of invincibility and inevitability is a close cousin that follows and that cousin is complacency. Mm -hmm. And then ever so subtly, you take your foot off the gas pedal mm -hmm. and you think you have it and then you play an opponent that doesn't buy into that, that doesn't stop playing and all of a sudden the game seems to slip away and you can't adjust because again, you're not aware of that change just happened in your mind. And all of a sudden certainty turns to uncertainty. Invincibility turns to being very vulnerable and you're gonna be in big trouble. So this is when we can see that rapid decline in performance of the, the team that's on top. Yes, and, and the inability to course correct. Yeah, yeah. We've just had a big example of this in uh, in the Champions League, actually. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. there will be an example of that, right? The famous one here in North America: Super Bowl between the Falcons and the Patriots. When 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 the Falcons were up like twenty eight three three quarters wow. in the game, right? And then lost the game. Wow. But yes, I think the Champions League is an example of that, where something happens late in the game, you think you have it. By this collective mindset, all of a sudden reality challenges that mindset, and yeah. then you can adjust to what's about to happen. I sometimes use this physical metaphor that might kind of relate to that. In <clears throat> you know that I often get asked, you know, when I'm when I'm so close to the finish line, or when I have one hand on the trophy. I'm from a golf background, by the way. Okay. Um, when I have one hand on the trophy, you know, a three shot lead playing the last two holes you know so often people feel that they're most vulnerable 
in those moments when they're so close to the finish line. And I use this physical metaphor of, if you imagine uh, a lion on the savannah and they're chasing the trophy, you know, the wildebeest or whatever. And as they leap, you know, in that last moment, what is then exposed is their underbelly. Yeah. So in, in jumping onto the back of the, the buffalo, they are at the most vulnerable because if they get kicked, you know, their organs are exposed. Um, that seems to kind of do a pretty good job with, with my clients of, of explaining, you know, those two things come together. You know, that sense of I'm just about to achieve the, this wonderful thing, but at the same time, I, I feel like, you know, everything could be lost and I feel incredibly vulnerable in those moments. Yeah, I, again, I, I love that, right? Because I think what you're doing there is, is, is you, you normalize that vulnerability. Um, and not only do you normalize it, but you also sort of highlight that it, it's to a certain extent needs to happen mm. if, you get, if you wanna get the trophy, right? Yeah. And what I would add to that is the hand on the trophy, okay? that is an image, a thought the mind produces. Okay? You didn't choose to have that thought. It just came. Um, and that thought is going to take you into the future. Mm. But the future hasn't happened yet. Mm. right? And that thought paints a very interesting picture about the future, right? A very enticing picture about the future, which is why it tries to lure you there, right? But this is again, where the mindfulness practice is so important because I can be aware of what the mind is doing, right? I can be aware of that hijack into the future. So you're lying in the savannah, most likely when that lion jumps, isn't thinking about how great the meal is gonna taste. <laughs> so I would argue the lion most likely has no thought getting in the way, but rather is really focused on the neck of that wildebeest. Yeah, yeah. So what is the neck of the wildebeest for the golfer in that moment? And I don't, yeah. I don't know any more golf, I, it's not a sport I work with or have worked with, um, there will be some some kind of contextual cue, you know, that's that's bespoke to the the golfer, you know, within their routine. That would be my guess. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So that's the neck. That's that's a nice. Yeah. What what is what is the neck that you need to be aiming for? I like that. That's a that's a really nice way of putting it. I, you could almost say going for the jugular, right? You know, it, what would that look like if you were to go to the jugular right now? What does that look like? Yes. So, so if I come back to the lion, right, and the question I would ask is, is what sensory perception is the lion tuning into? My guess would be sight. Mm. I'm sure the lion is seeing. Okay, he's, he's so a target, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't know what that means. Is in golf? That's going again. That's that's that you need the golf expert for that, right? But for many of my athletes, we're a team sport athlete. Um, if they can come back in the moment to seeing the ball mm. or seeing the field or seeing the defense or seeing where the holes are in the defense, right? Then again, they're anchoring themselves in the present moment, right? Yeah. So, so like, I'm not an expert on, on, on football, but coming back to this champion league example, um, my guess is Real Madrid stayed in the moment. Yeah. In order for them to score those goals, they had to be very, very focused in the moment, right? And that, that is connected to sight. It's connected to seeing. Mm. I'm thinking of, 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 of uh, you know, Yer Shorde's research in Norwegian, you know, on, on scanning in football. Yeah. Right? That has to do with seeing. Mm. So if you scan, that's in the moment. It's happening right now, yeah, right? Yeah, that yeah. puts you in the present. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it more difficult for those thoughts uh, about having the hand on the trophy 
to intrude and get in the way. Mm. So Manchester City, who were on the receiving end of those two goals in injury time, um, were possibly getting caught up in and distracted by those thoughts of victory. And that can just interfere with those crucial moments and they just to slow them down enough with their reaction speeds and so on. Yes, if we can play Monday morning quarterback here, right? That, 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 yeah. that would be my guess that when they have that lead, invariably, invariably, the thought will pop up, we got this. Mm. Awesome. We're going to the you know, Champion League final. That's going to pop up. That's not the problem. The problem is if you're not aware of that thought popping up, and if you don't realize how that thought starts to control your behavior, and then when that thought actually gets challenged by the reality on the ground, oops, they scored, we might we don't actually not have that habit or lose it, right? And then don't realize the unpleasant emotions that come up with that. Mm. And those emotions begin to control your behavior, then yeah. you're in trouble. So mindfulness is a, a concept that many people listening to this will have heard of or be somewhat familiar with. And what I'd like to discuss is that the West has a history of um, really ruining some, some wonderful Eastern concepts and traditions. In what way may you, may you have seen mindfulness being misused? The way it comes up for me in my world, um, well, let's talk about the world in the military because they're introducing mindfulness to the military, mm. um, is if I practice mindfulness, I'm going to have the right thoughts and the right feelings. And if I practice mindfulness, I'm going to be in a flow-like state at the Olympic Games. Uh, so when I sort of hear that and see that, uh, I'm sort of shaking my head. Um, and if I'm sort of make a bold statement here is, is the practitioner who advocates for that clearly has never worked with anybody at the Olympic Games. Right. I, I have yet to meet an athlete at the games who experiences flow-like states. Mm -hmm. If you look at the elements of flow, right? Don't get me wrong, I, I love flow, fantastic concept, right? But there's a challenge, there's a balance between challenge and skills. Yes. Right? And they need to be high, right? So if you're competing for a gold medal at the games, clearly you have the skills, no doubt about it, right? And the challenge matches those skills. But the problem in that environment at the games is, is the games introduce uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen and you don't know if you're going to win. But the, the mind craves certainty because uncertainty is uncomfortable, mm. right? The mind craves certainty. Yeah, so, okay, I, 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 I want, want to believe I'm going to win. So let me do mindfulness. And I get calm. And then calm doesn't show up. Mm. Because again, there is uncertainty, right? So the equation I offer is, is if the outcome means the world to you and the outcome is uncertain, guess what emotion will show up? Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, the opposite of uh, feeling calm and collected and confident. It's the opposite of feeling calm and collected, right? But then think, okay, I'm going to use mindfulness to get calm. Uh, you're, you're setting the trap for your own mind, right? So to me, combining mindfulness and flow is, is a mistake. And, and actually, a failure to understand what mindfulness is actually all about. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I have experienced flow from time to time. Um, in performances and in uh, 
you know, just random spots. I actually remember one time, just completely odd. Uh, I experienced flow in the queue for the supermarket, which is really, really odd experience. Mm -hmm. um, but the times I have experienced flow seems to have been, you know, by accident. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's just happened. So is there a? And then, of course, uh, as soon as you kind of are aware that you're in flow and what a pleasant experience that is, then you're kind of falling in and out of flow because uh, you're not in the present moment. You're thinking about, you know, the flow, the lo lovely flow that you're experiencing. Um, so would there be a danger in terms of pursuing flow and practicing trying to be in flow? Well, the, the simple answer is yes, right? But you talked about flow happening and happening accidentally. So my interpretation of that is you weren't grasping for it. Mm, yeah. Okay. And then it's again, what, 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 what mindfulness and, and Buddhism is so helpful, right? So there's this grasping for it, for something, right? This grasping for the win or this grasping for a particular emotional state actually makes that state more elusive mm. and you're going to suffer because you're not going to get there right so like, so, uh, like happiness like like happiness yes mm. yes correct yes yes mm. I, I could see how that would be another one of your stds yes yeah <laughs> that i need to feel and and sorry if anyone's listening and, and hearing this for the first time but this might be um kind of this is a this is a real big one brian I need to feel happy in order to live well. Uh, that's a that, that's an unwinnable game. That's a rigged game. Yes, yes. Which is similar to I need to be confident to be successful at the Olympic Games. Yeah. So, flow. Um, actually, I, I suppose people even can experience flow when you know watching a movie. They really you know, they're really enjoying that. I, I imagine that can be a flow like experience, um, which is maybe what makes them so appealing. Um, but the moment we're kind of trying to, as you say, grasp for it, you say, say that so beautifully, actually, it's such a wonderful image. Um, the moment we're grasping for it, then it almost slips, slips away, would you say, or is more likely to slip away from us? Yes, yes. Again, I, I, I'll come back with my athletes to Rafael Nadal. Yeah. Right? In his autobiography, he says, what I battle hardest in a tennis match is to quiet the voices inside my head. To shut everything out but the contest itself. To concentrate every atom of my being on the point of playing. If I made a mistake on the prior point, let it go. Should a thought of victory suggest itself, crush it. <laughs> so that, that it's, it's a long quote, right? But let's let's say, say with, with the end here. Should a thought of victory suggest itself, crush it. So he understands that the mind will offer up a thought of victory, pleasant thought comfortable thought, thought full of confidence, right? He understands that thought actually isn't helpful. What he's trying to do is concentrate every atom of his being on the point he's playing. That's really well put, really well written, right? Concentrate every atom of your being on the point you're playing. Right? So, so that is attention is the currency of performance. It's not thought, it's not feelings. So attention isn't, isn't a thought process. Mm -hmm. It happens in a different part of the mind from where thinking happens, right? So, so he understands that thought of victory is grasping for something in the future, for something you want to get. But what we really need to work on is being present right here, right now. Mm -hmm. 
that's such a <clears throat> such an odd thing to hear from uh, you know such a, an incredibly successful sports person who who looks so full of confidence you know from the outside in you see in his body language and you see the way he moves and from the outside in you would hear the commentators say all the time um, he looks so confident on his backhand today but what you're saying or what he's saying is actually that's not necessarily what's happening on the inside yes so, so, so i think this was 2018 maybe 2017 not 100 sure us open he was asked by a reporter um you know it's, it, it feels like I'm, I'm stalking rafael nadal here right right I, <laughs> I read all these interviews because again he's Brilliant. so so insightful right but he's, he's asked brilliant. by the reporter He's asked by the reporter, you looked so confident out there. I think it was a semifinal at the US Open. And Nadal, you know, in his funny English goes, no, was not confident. <laughs> was nervous, was nervous. Brilliant. And then he goes on, but the body language, I control. Yeah. Okay. So, so I control how I carry my body in space here. And he says, wasn't the time to have bad body language? Mm. Okay. So he gets to something that's truly, I think, you know, that I learned again from ACT is, is that confidence is a feeling, right? But it's also an action. Mm. And I can take the action of confidence prior to the feeling. Okay. So Nadal is saying is I control my body language. I can do that irrespective of how I feel. I might feel nervous, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the by language I control. This is the action of confidence, and then very often the feeling falls afterwards. Yeah. How often do you hear athletes say, "This win gives me confidence"? Yes. Yeah. All the time, right? All the time. All the time. Well, that begs the question: If the win gives you confidence, what was there before? Yeah. Well, an absence of that feeling of confidence. Well, mm -hmm. how did you get the win? Well, by how you carried yourself in that competition, by the actions you took. And then the feeling came afterwards. So, okay, yes. so what are the actions you want to take? Yeah. And can you bring our attention to the actions you want to take rather than, rather than a feeling? One thing I, I sometimes use with clients, um, <clears throat> you know, because the, these, are, these are very novel concepts to, to a lot of people, you know, maybe myself included 10 years ago. Um, but one thing that really kind of slows them in their tracks is when I say, uh, kind of asking them to describe what confidence is. And of course, they, you know, they come up with something about, you know, the look of Cristiano Ronaldo before a free kick, uh, or something like this. And, you know, he's actually got a horrible record, by the way, but uh, that's another story. Um, but then I say to them, well, how about this? I'm, I'm going to say to you something that's incredibly personal and delicate information can I tell you this in confidence? And that slows people down because they're hearing now that that word has more than one meaning. Huh. If I'm telling them something in confidence, it's more in line with the original meaning of that word, which is con, like chili con carne, with con and fides, fidelity. Can I tell you something? with trust or faith and that slows people down it starts to kind of maybe that std is has a question mark on it as, as to, to kind of to what you said yeah beautiful right so, so i grew, grew up in austria you know so, so german is, is part of my language here so to speak but in german confidence is selbst vertrauen trust in self Mm. or self-trust right so similar to, to your latin definition here of, of, of confidence um this is and again i, I love how, how you 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 put this this slowing down right and tell you something in confidence beautifully done um because we confuse confidence with with assurance that i'm going to win assurance mm. of the outcome right and the reality will challenge that because there is no assurance yeah 
because our so, minds love our minds love to read the tea leaves. Yes, right. And and, and minds are never wrong. It's <laughs> <laughs> the other part. Um, beautiful. Um, this has been such an insightful conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I hope people that um, have watched this will, they, they, I mean, there are some things here, as I said, that really might, you know, pull the rug out from under some people, but hopefully in a good way. And if they re-listen, um, you know, may, maybe they might pick up on some other bits as well. But if someone was to kind of look a little bit more in finding a bit more of your work or um, was interested in following up on this, then, then where might they look? They might have a hard time finding me. <laughs> what, what, where, where, were you, where would you direct them? Well, I, I've, 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 uh, I've contributed some publications, uh, mindfulness and performance, um, with some international colleagues. So I can sort of be found in some of the, somewhat in the academic literature a little bit. Mm. Um, but I don't have like a web page, you know. No, no. Um, I'm not on social media. Um, Any book recommendations for uh, for an athlete? Yeah, when I get that question, I actually recommend uh, for athletes uh, athlete autobiographies. Ah, okay. Right? So I would start with 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 Rafa Rafa the Yeah. 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 Novak Djokovic served to win. Right? Pete Sampras autobiography. There was a wonderful piece in there on the inner critic. Mm. Right? How to work with with the inner critic. Um, Chris Hoy's autobiography is all about yeah. sports psychology. Right. Uh, so so that's kind of what where I would start with with the athletes, uh, rather than go to the academic literature. Yes, of is, course. Is, yeah. is is. is you know, read your fellow athletes, yeah, because because they actually understand. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking of this this amazing amazing uh, article Michaela Schifrin wrote last week on on grief uh, mm -hmm. in the Players Tribune. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Players Tribune is this publication that has sort of athlete voices, and and. I'm sort of a regular reader of those 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 voices because yeah, they sort of tell you what's really happening in, in their minds, right? And, and yeah. Um, I think that's a good place to start for athletes. Brilliant. I will get the details uh, for that from you and I'll, I'll put that in the show notes so people can have a look into that. But uh, yeah, I myself will have a look into that as well. As you said, kind of hearing from the horse's mouth, so to speak, is, is um, a great place to start. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Peter. Yeah, thank you for having me, Trevor. This was really delightful. Thank you. So there we have it. Attention is the currency of performance, not thoughts and not feelings. The biggest myth in all of sport is I must feel confident in order to perform. And I just wonder, if you were to think about where it, where it was when you first heard the idea that I must feel confident in order to, in order to perform. I've spent some time in terms of considering uh, my own history with that and uh, I'm just sure I found it in a Nike advert years and years ago. And by the way, they were only too happy to sell me that feeling. So is it really that we've been duped? Hmm. I, uh, my favorite moment of that episode was uh, Peter talking about Rafa Nadal, French Open, one of the greatest records in all of sports. Um, every year I have self-doubt, every match I have self-doubt doesn't stop him from performing. So, I hope you've uh, gained as much from this interview as I have, and I look forward to seeing you next time for another interesting and engaging chat.